Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to go through Ecclesiastes, all of it. So last week I made a joke about the two hours because Kim was talking. Well, I'm going for three hours, and uh, we'll see. So order your DoorDash food. You might be here a little while. No, just kidding. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting just uh, have been reading Ecclesiastes and then knowing, okay, it's my turn to speak, thinking, what, what do you want me to speak on, God? And what I like about God, of the many things, is sometimes he's very clear with me, like, I want you to talk on this topic, like last time I spoke. I didn't even have a chance to think the thought of, what am I going to teach on? He was like, this is what I want you to think on, right? He, like, knew if I don't get in there before Brian's brain gets in there, he might not listen to me. So he, like, said it right away. And then this one, I was, he was like, you're already, you're already reading something. Just teach on that. There's, there's so much good stuff inside just what you regularly read on a regular basis, and that's something that I've learned through life is that sometimes a struggle is coming up and, you know, you're on that struggle bus and you're thinking, well, let me go get a, a, a book that tells you like a concordance. Like, well, you look at the topic, it gives you the scripture and you think, OK, the answer is going to be in here somewhere. And then it's not. Those scriptures just aren't working. And then other times when I just, you know, what, I'm just keep reading. Not that I like had this amazing thought. I'll just read and God will show up. But as I'm reading, God has shown up. And so that's what's happened now. It's just in my normal reading, God has showed up and said, there's a lot of good stuff in Ecclesiastes. And there's a lot of Ecclesiastes. There's 12 chapters. So we're going to try and get through the parts to me that stood out, uh, the verses that stood out, and some of the things that, you know, Solomon noted inside of Ecclesiastes. So let's pray for this service, and then we'll get started. Lord, we just come right now, and we ask, Lord, that all distractions be removed, uh, Watches don't ping and people don't text us, Lord, and nobody calls us. Our stomachs don't get hungry, Lord. Our mind doesn't start. Our taste buds, they stay deactivated for a little bit, Lord. And uh, we can just listen to the word that you have for us and we can learn from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so when you get to Ecclesiastes, the main thing that uh, we think about with Ecclesiastes is there's some scriptures that come to mind, right? And so the first one was is in Ecclesiastes 3, which is to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die. And then, and that's one that you hear a lot. That's even quoted in like movies and things of that nature. And there's another one, which is there's nothing new under, under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1.9. And people like saying just that part of the scripture. And it's one of those, if you know, you know type of things like, yeah, I know, right? But there's a whole lot more in Ecclesiastes. But after finishing Ecclesiastes, I kind of get the idea about like, okay, this is why people don't like to read it too much. But there's some good general nuggets in there, and there's like an overall theme to get out of it. So that's what we're going to try to get to today. So, second. All right, so a couple of things that we can take away from Ecclesiastes, just if you read all 12, one of the first things I took away was that we need a relationship with our Savior. Life is full of ups and downs, it's highs and lows, and the one that uh, doesn't always make sense, contradictions. And that's where Jesus comes in. Now, if you want peace and joy, that's where Jesus comes in. And as we get towards the end, it's going to start to make more sense as far as the things we're struggling for and what real peace and what real joy is. And we're going to find that inside here in his writings. There's also an offset to the positive and negative. That's something else we can pull out of Ecclesiastes. However, what do we focus on? The negative. Yep, only Kenny's the one who does it. Apparently nobody else thinks about the negative. Sorry, Kenny. But the negative, right? That's what we think about the most. But if you really think about it, there's a lot of good that happens too. So there's this like balance, kind of imbalance. It's not 100% right. Maybe it's always, life is always teetering like this. But we pull that out of here. We also learned, at least I learned, is not to ignore the negative in life because we can learn from it. Right? So if I don't learn, then it hurts me even worse. If I do learn, then I can pull something out of it. One I don't like, <clears throat> but it's true, uh, wicked people can thrive. So I'll say it one more again. Wicked people can thrive, but their fate is worse than the good. Right? So maybe in this life they're thriving and you see it, <clears throat> but in the end, which is what eternity and heaven, relationship with Jesus is about, it, we have a better well, I'm assuming there's a we that we in here have that, right? And then also I learned that we need a relationship with the Savior. So 
we might have that come up a couple of times today. So, all right, let's talk. Uh, so this is the verse that stood out to me the most, which was Ecclesiastes 1, 2. He says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanity, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And it just stops right there. And I've, I've heard that before. I've read it before. But it's thinking about, like, well, what does it mean now since I'm actually studying it out, right? And so the, the commentary has this word, hevel. And I'm just going to read exactly what it says. It says, the Hebrew word hevel literally means breath or vapor. But it, be, it can be understood as vanity, meaningless, absurdity, or senselessness. The author of Ecclesiastes used the word to describe frustrating or unfair situations. And so when I read the definition of that word, right, now a vanity, it makes, wow, okay, this really makes more sense when you think about the list, which we're going to get into, of things that he's talking about. But if you just accept the word vanity for the way that it's kind of used, like somebody who's vain, it's usually meant for like a person. But in this case, he's talking about just vain, how things could just be useless or uh, meaningless and not so important in life. But we'll keep going. So what this made me think about with verse 2 was how, how much more depth there was to that. And so I thought, man, there's so many things in life that we work hard for. They're like little things, but we think they're big things, right? And so some of those big things are uh, the biggest one, I think, for me for the longest time was getting a raise at work. Um, and then cars and houses. Like those are kind of like big things that you may consider. If you think about it in life, when you're going through something, go talk to people about that kind of stuff. Right, And so when it came to a raise, I was thinking about one story and I, I, a while back when I think, I think we just had one, maybe two of the kids, and I was really, really, really trying to make more money. And for those of you who just are automatically going to start making 20 bucks an hour magically overnight, those of us who had to work really hard to make a 50 cent raise, which is what I had to do, one of the many 50 cent raises and quarter raises, I was like, yes. We're going to get so much done, and the kids are going to get fed. And then a couple of checks came through, and guess what? I didn't even notice it. Why is that? Because it's 40 bucks over two weeks. Th that doesn't go very far with diapers and all the things with babies, right? So it kind of like made me go like, what's the point of these raises, right? Working just for that raise and then getting the raise wasn't as great as I thought it was going to be. A couple of other things is cars and houses, but those are bought for status. So if you buy them because you want such a nice car, because people are going to see you, then you get it, and guess what? When people see you in the nice car, we think they're thinking, they think I'm cool, they think I'm awesome because I have a nice car. But what do you think when you see it? That's what they're thinking, right? I kind of want that car. I would like to be in that car. Or I might think bad things about that person, depending upon how nice the car is, right? So also big houses. Anybody ever just went to shop house shopping? Ever? Yeah, a couple people. And then you get you, you start off on the the big houses, right? And then the money says, "No. Go down the street, go down a couple blocks. You might, you know, get off the freeway a little bit, keep going, and then you that'll be in your neighborhood, right?" And then you get that let down feeling. And that's just no good. But then there's these little things, too, the shorter stuff in life that we, like, strive for, that we expect to get meaning out of, that we expect life to have more value. Like a smartphone. Anybody be born before smartphones? <clears throat> Anybody's parents made them learn on a flip phone? I know my kids did, right? And then you got a smartphone, and you're like, it's kind of dumb. It doesn't really do anything extra for me, right? How about people who like tattoos? Things are going to feel good. You're going to get a tattoo. You're going to do something. People are going to see it and think you're cool because you have all these tattoos. And then what? The next time they see you, they don't even go, man, that tattoo is still cool, man. I think you're the best. No. They're like, Does it hurt? Why would you do that? Are you sure you want to do that? Right? How about like a fancy watch or like an Apple watch? Right? When those first came out, you're like, ooh, I got to have those Apple watches. Why? Because you're worried about your heart rate, because you're a runner and you need to track your time, or because that guy has a fancy Apple Watch, and so I need a fancy Apple Watch. Clothes, that's another one. Fortunately, I don't worry about that too much, as you can tell. Uh, lunch, 
Mmm, doesn't lunch sometimes make you think, I can't wait for lunch? And I'm not talking about this morning's lunch. I'm talking about the, or this today's lunch. I mean tomorrow's lunch. I'm already excited for tomorrow. And then what happens after you eat it? <sighs> eh, the emotions come back. It really wasn't as great. Eh, they didn't cook it like they did last time. You know, we, we had this place down by the beach we went to, and they made these, co- these tacos so good, and everybody loved them, and that was like, so we drove down there to go again. The next time, I don't know if they fired the cook, but it was not the same. It was not as good. And then we were like, no, 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 next time, next time it's going to be good. Well, I think we're on our fifth time, and it hasn't happened yet. So I'm like, okay, I accept it for what it is. It's close to the beach, but it's not what it was. So it's kind of like a letdown, right, the excitement of something. Uh, another one that's a big gamble. I mean, this is a big gamble, right? You, you're talking about investing in the stock market. No, 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 this is taking an afternoon nap. Has anybody ever taken a nap and then wish they hadn't taken a nap? If you haven't, you're still too young. Don't worry, it'll come up. You're like, I got 20 minutes, I could take a 10 minute nap. And you woke up and you think, what bus drove through my room and hit me? Because I am worse than I was before I took a nap, right? So anyways, there's a couple of things in here that just, you know what? putting your hope in those things and thinking those things is going to be it, it's just kind of a letdown a lot of times in life. And that's like the theme that we're going to pull out of Ecclesiastes. But ultimately, it does remind me of why we need a Savior. It kind of brings me back to that. What a difference. I don't have any letdowns when I have a genuine relationship with God and I'm actually doing that relationship, not the one with the people. When I go to a group, oh, it's going to be good. I'm going to share this word and they're going to love it. And as I'm telling them why I love it, they talk over me to tell me why they love theirs, right? So I'm like, oh, man, I didn't even get to tell anybody. Well, Jesus is always listening, and he's always going to respond back to you. So we're going to get that as we continue on. Hmm. All right, so we're going to go into our introduction of our first scripture, which we're going to read, which is Ecclesiastes 1, 1 to 11. It says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanities. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and in its circuits to the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what it will be, and what has been done is what it will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things later yet to among those who come after. So you notice how in that first section, he's just observing the cycles of life, right, about the different things that go in there. And that's why I wanted to read all of it, because I feel like we kind of got to get into his head space before we get into the things that he says. If you don't really understand where he's coming from, what was he thinking when he was writing it? And I actually tried to call him, but he didn't answer, so I actually had to read the word instead to figure out what he was thinking. And so that's what we're doing here. Um, And now we're going to go into Ecclesiastes 1, 12 through 18. I, the preacher, have been king over over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. And what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart and no wisdom to know. uh, And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this is but a striving after wind, for in which wisdom is much vexation. And who receives knowledge increases sorrow. Yeah, so it's kind of like his resume. That's what he's basically saying. I've seen all these things. I've experienced and done all these things. So when I tell you what I'm about to tell you, I know a thing or two about what I'm about to tell you. 
So when you get into his, to the headspace of him, I'm going to list out some of the things that he lists in here, which is he had wives, 700 of them. I, I, told, I wasn't even going to bring it up. That's why I was like, I don't want anybody leaving, you know, injured today. Uh, concubines, 300. Slaves, land, treasure, wealth, wisdom, and he had a fear of God, which is a good thing to have. So he's not just some inexperienced person who's writing this scripture, right, who wrote this. He's been experienced. He's been through some things. And if you think about things like land, treasure, and wisdom, well, like myself, being 45, when I think about the land like renting versus owning, I've rented, and now I own and the difference in life that I've gone through, and so somebody who may be thinking about renting or owning would be able to get some information from me on that. Well, he had plenty of lands, so he could talk about the experience in life and the challenges that come from that, right? Treasure, think about buying things, okay? In his case, obviously he had all the treasure. In our case, maybe you wanna go get some furniture for your house, and you have to go and research it. Am I getting the right price? Am I getting ripped off? Is this really good value? And then you get and you bring it home, and it's not even over then, because then what do you have to do? Well, you have to protect it, because now you have all this stuff in your home, and you want to make sure that it's taken care of. So that's some another experience, and then there's just wisdom overall. And how come we don't put people who have just started at our company as the manager and the boss? Because they don't have the time, and they don't have the experience. They don't have the wisdom, right? And so when you think about it, when he's writing this as an old man who's gone through all these things, he's seen some stuff. So, I would, so don't discount the scriptures you don't like. Don't discount the part that doesn't make you feel good. Kind of say, well, why is he saying that? Why is he writing that? Okay. And also I'm going to note that some of, the, some of what he wrote, he's not saying it's right. He's just saying that it is. So that's an important thing that we have to deal with too. Uh, well, someone's going to catch me up on these slides. Uh, his first observation, because now I'm going to get into his observation. So instead of going through, like, all the scriptures piece by piece, what we're actually going to do is we're going to go through the observations that he's made inside of uh, Ecclesiastes. So the first one is vanity. And inside vanity, he points out that wisdom, pleasure, laughter, wine, sensible amount, great works, houses, planted vineyards, gardens, parks, fruit trees, pools, male and female slaves, herds and flocks, silver and gold, treasure of kings, singers, and concubines is all vanity, all in vain if you get it for obviously the wrong reasons. Ecclesiastes 2.10 says, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept from my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. And so why is he saying that's vanity? Because what he's saying is, in that moment, the reward was that thing. So just like earlier, we talked about, oh, lunch, I'm going to have lunch, and it's going to keep me satisfied for so long. And then as soon as lunch is over, I don't know, maybe I'm hungry again, right? So that's not really a good thing. But in life, when we strive for things, enjoy those moments, because that will be the reward, especially if your motive is wrong. That's just going to be the time you're going to have to enjoy that thing. The next one is wisdom versus folly. Ecclesiastes 2, 12 to 14. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what his, he has already been done. Then I saw that there was a more gain in wisdom than folly, as there is more gain in the light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that at the same time, or, and yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. So what is the same event that he's talking about? They die. So that's why you need to understand his headspace before you get into this, because it's a lot of it is like, well, they just die. A lot of his comparisons is, oh, that's good, but in the end, they both die. So if we're both going to die, what do we do? Well, at least he says, enjoy wisdom while you're alive, because your life will be a little bit better. But then at the same time, what does it remind me of? We need a savior. We need Jesus. Because at some point, when you get maybe older in your life, you're going to start to observe those things and, well, what was the point of all that, right? So hopefully at the end of this, you'll have figured out, ooh, let me make a point to do the things that I want to do, to do the right things to do in life. The next one is vanity of toil. So Ecclesiastes 2, 18 to 26. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, 
and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, that he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned it about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. So you kind of accept the word toil, but I'm, we're going to do what we did earlier. We're going to look it up. And toil is hard and continuous work, exhausting labor or effort. So we're going to reread verse 21, but we're going to put in the definition instead of the word toil and see if that makes more sense and really impacts you. So verse 21, because sometimes a person who has done hard, continuous work to the point of exhaustion with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not do hard work, hard, continuous work to the point of exhaustion for it. That is a way different thought now, right? And so when you read your Bible, you got to define words that you just accept. And you go, oh, I know what that word means. It means hard work. Yeah, but does it really? Right? So what he's saying is that if you do hard work and you don't, and what I'm taking from it anyways is the people below me or next in line to take over, like my children, or if you're at a business or a company, I, what I'm seeing is don't do all the hard work for them. Let them have the joy and the experience of doing their own hard work so that they'll appreciate some of the stuff that you have. So parents, you know you want to be like, I want to make it good. I want to have this. When they get into that scary real world out there, I want them to have all this taken care of. Right? But what I'm taking from this is if I do that, guess what? They're not going to, not only are they not going to appreciate it, right? Because that's one of the worst things you can do is work or not have happen for you is work really hard for someone, like sacrifice a lot, and they don't understand the sacrifice because they haven't gone through it. And then what happens to our hearts? We get bitter. We might get jealous. We don't even know what it's like to have to walk uphill both ways to go to school and before that smartphone and to go to a payphone and go, it's Brian, pick me up. And before the thing says, who's calling? You know, try to cheat the little phone system. You don't even know what it's like. I know where you are. The app is, right? You just, nope, we sent our kids off and we came home when the lights were on. And if they didn't, we might call 911, right? But now it's like, ooh, where are they at? What corner are they on? It's just crazy, all this stuff out there. So kind of reeling it back in, think about some of the stuff that you're doing. And as you find by doing that, you're going to enjoy life more. And he does get later on talking about enjoying life more. So it is, it's coming. Hang in there with me. Uh, the next one is a time for everything. Ecclesiastes 3.1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And then verses 2 through 8, he goes through the different seasons. So I'm going to just hit the key word and make it a little faster. So there's a time to born, to die, to plant, to pluck, to kill, to heal, to break down, to build up, to weep, laugh, mourn, dance, cast away stones, gather stones, embrace, refrain from embracing, seek, lose, keep, cast away, tear, sow, keep silent, speak, love, hate, war, and peace. I don't even know if he missed anything. I, I think he, he covered all the things in life that we're going to go through. And so part of what I've learned through this is that there just are seasons in life. There just are times to go through things. And in this moment, when I looked at, thought my kids, now they're not little anymore, as you guys have seen, um, but when they were little, there were so many little bumps and bruises of life they had to learn. And there was times I'm like, all right, you're not going to touch that again, watch. And then, right, and that's how I learned. Now they're in their next up years, young adult years, and they're going through some more fun stuff. And I'm like, okay, not how I would do it, but you're going to do it your way, and you're going to learn your stuff. Why? Why am I comfortable with that? It's not because I don't care, but because I learned through my own bumps and bruises, and we learned from our own stuff. And we also were in the headspace of, don't tell me. You're, what do you know? We know stuff, right? And then I look forward to the future, to those of you ahead of me, to those of you who already have gone through the season that I'm in right now, and some of you have wished you made decisions when you were in my season or in their season, and there's nothing you can do about it. And then some of you, you couldn't even make the decision, so now you're in this season. So don't be stressing. Like, I'm not stressing right now over the stuff, A, I can't go back and change, and B, the stuff, the decisions I can't make until I get there to live that life. 
But sometimes we do stress over those things so much today, and it just ruins it. It ruins it when you get there, and then it ruins it before you get there. Then you get there, and you're like, oh, man, I remember the good old days. I wish I had those back again. And, you know, there's something that my wife said one time, and it was really cool, is that uh, we are in the good old days. Right now, you're in the good old days, so enjoy it. Don't forget it. All right, the next thing, another good one. God put eternity on our hearts. Ecclesiastes 3, 9 to 15. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into a man's heart. So yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. So if you needed permission to enjoy your job, you just got it. Congratulations. You can go to work and not feel bad that you're working. Isn't that kind of a weird thing that some of you are going, yeah, that is right, because I don't go to the church every week, and I'm not there when they're there, and here I am doing this thing. And sometimes there's these little, little things in life that make you feel bad, right? Especially if you go on Instagram and you see people doing stuff like, oh, man, how come they're always better than me? I hate that. Just get off Instagram. <laughs> but God put eternity into our hearts, into a place where it's like we're thinking about heaven. We're thinking about what's life going to be like afterward, right? But he also made it so that what? We have no idea when that's going to happen. I don't know when my eternity is going to start. So guess what I should do in the meantime, which is what he tells us here should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil, that that's a gift from God that we get to enjoy life. We get to enjoy moments with people around us. So when you put those things together, if you're going to lunch with anybody today, don't think that lunch is bigger than it is. Enjoy that lunch. Be present in that lunch. And then when you leave and you found yourself going like, ah, oh, man, I was really hoping they would think I'm cooler than I am or better than I am, you already messed up. Just enjoy that time. Find another one, and then enjoy that time, and be where you are. And so there's some, there's some stuff you can take when you, when you start to understand the knowledge or the idea of the way Solomon's thinking. So then we have work based on envy, Ecclesiastes 4.4. Then I saw that all the toil and all the skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. So a very short one, real short. But what it basically tells me is that doing something just because somebody else is doing it, right, or keeping up with the Joneses, well, that's just vanity. That's just chasing the wind. Now, this is worse than you doing something that you enjoy, that maybe it's a hobby, and you think, well, it's a hobby. It's not really going to do anything. It's not going to make any money. Hey, go enjoy that thing. You need that peace. You need that relaxation. This is you doing something because somebody else is doing it. And when I read Striving After the Wind, it made me think of, like, has anybody ever dropped a piece of paper on the floor on a mildly windy day? Have you seen somebody do it? It's kind of fun, you know. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't admit it from the stage, but uh, it's kind of fun. I go, ah, look, he's trying to catch that paper. And then it happens to me too, and I'm like, oh, right? But what happens when you see someone doing it, and you're like, I got to chase after that paper too. You don't even know what's on that paper. It turns out it was just a napkin. It's not even important in your life. It won't make anything better for you because you already got napkins in your pocket. But you're chasing it, and you're, you're just you're about to get it, and then the wind moves it. And does it blow it so far that you get demotivated like when a balloon flies off? No. It goes just a couple more steps, just a couple more steps. The next thing you know, you're in traffic, and it's dangerous, and it's like, okay, is this thing really worth it? It's not. It's not worth it, especially when it's somebody else's thing. So if you want to go chasing after things, and it doesn't matter to you, you're doing it because your internal motive is, oh, my neighbor has that. You know, they got their house painted. They got a nice new car. They got a, a, they got a new lawnmower. Whatever might happen, whatever thing that you think of so-and-so is going to care that I bought this thing before I care that I bought this thing. 
that you better stop and actually make, make sure that that's the right thing for you to do. Because guess what? You're going to get it, and you're going to go show so-and-so, and so-and-so has probably already got the next thing that they saw somebody else going after, and now what? You're chasing their thing again. And it's no good. It's a waste of life. All right, don't make empty promises to God. Ooh, tough one here. Especially because here we are in church, and we're going to read that right now. Ecclesiastes 5. We're just going to read verse 1, but it's 1 through 7. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To, to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. So my first thought when I heard that was like, people try to make deals with God, right? And in this case, I think like they're all gathered together like we are now, and then someone gets up and says like, oh, I will do this amazing thing for the church, and I will do this amazing thing. And then later on, he says uh, in verse 6, it says, let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? So the reason I put those together, I sandwich it in there, is because what that means is that this is a commitment that that place thought you were going to do, that they sent somebody to go collect on your commitment, whether it was money, whether it was your time, whether it was a gift, it's something you had in your house, and now that person's coming to collect. And you're like, uh, what? Making excuses. Either you never intended to do it in the first place, or maybe you did and you didn't think it through, or maybe you really you were doing it again because people around you were doing something, but you really weren't doing it for God. And now it's time to collect. And you're just like, well, I really I try to reason out of it. Well, at that time it was this, but now it's this. And so it's really just saying, don't make empty promises to God. Now he's talking about here in the church, but I would just say, just make that a standard. It's better that you don't open your mouth. It's better that you just listen. On those mornings, if you're reading your word or you're going through something difficult, don't make empty promises to God like, like you're bartering with him. He's not going to be fooled anyways. So, well, Lord, if you just do this for me, then I'm going to do this for you. So can we pull something good out of Ecclesiastes? I think we can. Remember that next time you're not in a good spot. All right, maybe an obvious one, but money doesn't satisfy. Ecclesiastes 5, 10 to 12. He who loves, I'm going to say loves money, will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, and whatever advantage has their owner, uh, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the stomach, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. So loving money, not using money, not having money, but loving money is, just leads you to dissatisfaction. Because it's one of those things where the more you have it, the more you don't have it, the more you want to keep trying to get it. And it's just continual grab, this continual thing to just have more and more money. And like he says here, when the goods increase, they increase who eat them. So the more you have, guess what? The more people that are going to come around to use your money. One of the things that it reminded me of was, anybody ever heard of idle games? Like on your phone, they're just called idle games. Maybe you have, maybe you played them, so don't get offended. But I did one, it was about making money. And you just press the button, then you tell it to do this, then you try and do this, and you get these little workers, and as they get better, they get more skills, so you upgrade them, and then you get more workers, then you get factories, and it keeps going and going and going. Well, the idle part comes in when you close it. It keeps running in the background. So then you open it up, and it's like, wow, look at all that money that I got. And you work a little harder, and you work a little harder, and you keep trying to program it a little bit better, and you try to fine-tune it, and you close it. And you come back again. And then it gets to an insanely absurd amount of money, so far out of my normal thought process, that guess what? I'm no longer satisfied. I don't open the game. It's dumb. I don't even want to play anymore. I go try and find a new game to maybe satisfy that urge again to play a game or have something to do on my phone. And that's what, that's what he's talking about. 
Now, maybe nobody in this room has that problem with having so much money that you're bored with it, but he knows what it's like. And so if today your goal is, man, I wish I did have so much money that I was bored with it, at least you learned something, that's not a goal that I want. That's not something that I want to set my mind toward. Okay? He's going to tell us a little bit more about places that we can set our mind toward, but we already talked about it. Just enjoying the time that you have, enjoying the moment, because that's the reward for those things, instead of chasing after all that money. He also points out that the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. So he's even saying, like, you know, the people who own all the tech companies out there and the millionaires and the billionaires that you hear about on TV, they're not sleeping as well as what he describes as the laborer. And I kind of feel like, yeah, right, no one really believes that. But then, has anybody ever done, like, Saturday yard work? And then has anybody ever, like, enjoyed Saturday night, I just did yard work for the day experience? Maybe you have. If you haven't, you should try it. Sometimes we're like, what do you want to do tonight? Well, I really want to sit on my butt and do nothing and watch TV. But you know how I'll enjoy that moment more guilt-free? If I go spend a couple hours in the yard today, if I go take care of a project around the house that I know I need to get taken care of, so that that by 1 or 2 o'clock, if I'm done, I can then sit around and I have no guilt. And if, and if you haven't done it, go try it tomorrow or the next Saturday, whatever it is, it's one of the best feelings you can have. Because what are you going to say to yourself? What is yourself going to tell yourself? Go fix that. Hey, I already did that. Somebody walk, man, I don't like the way that looks, but I did that over there. And so that's the part of life that you want to get to, is not I didn't do it because I was competing with my neighbor. I did it for myself. And now I can sit and have that sweet sleep of a laborer that he's talking about. Okay, righteousness and wickedness. Ecclesiastes 7, 15 to 18. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life for his, in his evil doing. But um, be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this and from that withhold and from that and not withhold your hand for the one who fears God shall come out of both of them. So we see this happen today. People who shouldn't be in places where they are are the wicked thrive and the righteous they don't seem to. And then people around you tell you what? See, God's not there, God doesn't love you, God doesn't exist or else why would he let these injustices happen? Now, I know what you're hoping I'm going to tell you, the why, but that's not what happened here. All he's saying is that it's happened in his time. And so my comfort was, it's not new. The injustices of life, the imbalances of life, is, it may feel new to you because now you're finally experiencing them, but it's not new. Solomon wrote about this a long time ago, and the wisest person that you will in the Bible didn't say, now here's how you solve all these problems. He just said, this is happening. Also, his advice on righteousness, he tells us what? Not to be so righteous that you put yourself in a, you put your faith in your righteousness. That's a problem. And when we do that, when I was younger and I, I got this job and I was like focused on doing the right thing because that's what the rules said to do. And I did this and I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. And it upset the people around me who weren't following the rules the way I was. And the main reason it upset them was because I wasn't doing it because the reason the rule existed. I was doing it because the rule existed. And that's kind of the same thing. If we're trying to be righteous and we're trying to do good just because righteousness exists, that's not the right reason to do it. It's to do it because we love our Savior. It's because of the relationship with God. It's because I'm trying to do something for Him. And it kind of goes, I mean, you're seeing the pattern through Ecclesiastes, of how much, at the end of the day, it's coming down to our heart. What's inside here? What's inside here? What is my motive for the things that we're doing? And not much you usually hear about Ecclesiastes, but it is in here. A nice good one. Don't be easily offended and have grace for people. So, Ecclesiastes 7, 21 to 22. Do not take... 
to the heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. I think when I read, I was like, you know, it kind of reminds me of like those candid camera videos and that person didn't know they were on camera and then they get all embarrassed when they're on camera and they know they would have probably tried to act different. Like sometimes when I'm walking to the shops that I go to a visit, and maybe this happened to you, but there's like this camera you don't know exists, but then it tells you that what? You're on camera, I'm recording you. Now as far as I can tell, I wasn't doing anything wrong, but guess what? Was I saying anything? Did I step on something I shouldn't have stepped on? I kind of get a little bit cautious about myself. Now, what this is saying is, and the reason I bring that up is just imagine now you have the camera and you see someone say something. Like those ring doorbells, I got one. And one of the reasons I didn't want to get one is because I don't want to know what people think. Because I know what things I think. And finding out that you think the same thing that I think about me, that may not be a good thing, right? And you should, you should put up those little safeguards for yourself. So I've learned it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. But sometimes you see those funny videos where somebody's outside the front house saying things. And it turns out everybody in my family is totally righteous. They've never said a bad thing. I've gone through hours of videos. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. I see who's there and I move on. That's all I want to know because I don't want to hear something. But I just think that. And what is he saying here? When you find out that somebody who you don't think would say something bad about you does, don't take it to heart. Just relax a little bit. So good piece that I pulled out of there. This one you're going to all love, especially as we get closer to lunch. Eat and drink and be joyful. Ecclesiastes 8, 14 to 15. There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this is also vanity, and I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. So good things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to good people. Anybody surprised by that? No, but neither was he. So knowing this, what he's saying is, go ahead and enjoy eating. Go ahead and enjoy drinking. And I'm not saying alcohol, crazy drinking, but there's some really good tasting teas and lemonades and sodas out there and water that you can really enjoy. But he's just saying, ah, don't stress over that stuff. Don't let it ruin your life. And this is all I'm going to say on politics. You probably just turn it back a knob or two because that's the kind of stuff that's just going to make you not enjoy life. That's the kind of stuff that's going to have you so stressed out. And the mechanism is di designed to do that, to make you think if you watch it enough, if you open it enough, if you subscribe to enough things that you're going to know the future before it happens. And that's not how they're not going to tell it to you anyways, even if they could. Because why? They have to make money off of it. So what do I get from this? Enjoy the people you eat those meals with. It's okay to do it. You guys don't look very happy by that. You should. Enjoy the meals with the people around you. Take time. Slow down a little bit. Be in that moment. Even to the point of right now. I know we prayed that our taste buds would back off, but our taste buds, they're aggressive little suckers, right? So be here right now. Like Enjoy what's happening. I like this one. We are in God's hands. Ecclesiastes 9.1, but all that I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. So almost a little bit repetitive, but we don't know what's going to happen, right? So don't waste time trying to figure it out. I know in my younger years, I would think about that kind of stuff way more than I probably should have because there's nothing, there, no matter what, I couldn't do it. God designed it so we won't know, again, when is our end? When is the end? When does eternity start? But there's a lot of things out there that will try to make you think about just that and only that, and then you end up not enjoying the now, the moment that you have. 
So when you start to worry, and here's how you know you're worrying. Here's how I know I'm worrying anyways. I'm planning. I'm planning. I've gone through it, and now I'm back to the beginning again, and I'm like on the second or third time. Now I'm worrying because there's nothing. I've already done the steps. I've already done the right thing. If I know I check this box and I plan this, or I can't make other decisions until the actual day comes, but yet here I am thinking about it again, that's when you start to worry. And that's when your body takes that toll of worry. And that's when your relationships take that toll. And that's when the people you're talking to, they just know something's not right. And worry doesn't give you the answer. Worry doesn't bring it about any faster. So when you're feeling that, this is what I'm pulling out of that, you're in God's hands. There's nothing to worry about. Your eternity's already set. If you have Jesus as your Savior, you know where you're going. So call somebody up, go have a coffee, go have a dinner, and enjoy a meal with somebody. Amen? Hmm. All right. We're going to skip a couple, unfortunately. Uh, we're going to go to you just know, you just don't know, so go. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 6. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty, them, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north in the place where the tree falls, there it shall be. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike. And so this tells me, like as a small business owner, that I should just go for it. I should do different things. Because what he's telling you here is nothing's guaranteed. Nothing is certain. No decision that I choose to make is a guaranteed winner. So do stuff in the morning and also work in the night, in the night is what he's saying. Because some of that, one of those, or both of those, could pan out for you. He talks about casting your bread upon the waters which I thought was kind of a weird thing, but it's basically saying, well, if that's your, whatever that tool you have or that equity you have or that investment you have, like send it out and let it return back in, good, in a good way because you don't know, right? Chasing after the wind type of stuff. What I like is uh, this phrase, he says, where the tree falls, there it shall lie. What did that mean to me immediately was, it is what it is. I say that all the time. In the automotive industry, that's one of our most coined terms. Why? It is what it is. What are you going to do? That's the way it is. Right? And that's what he told you. You saw a tree. It went this way or it could have went that way. What, what did you have to do with that tree falling one way or the other? And now it's on the ground. It lies where it lies. It is what it is. And so it just makes me go, okay, back up a little bit. Stop getting so crazy about stuff. Stop overthinking. I don't know if you have the same feeling that I have, but I like if I had a meter next to me when I'm stressing on things, like it literally I can feel it get to like here in my head. Like this part of my head feels good and this part of my head does not. Like literally that's what happens. And you know what that tells me? I gotta stop. I gotta take a break. I go for a little walk. I get some water because I am just up in my head and I'm not actually making the progress that I want to make. So he concludes with Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So all the things you see in life, all the stuff that you're looking at, all the challenges out there, everything you're facing, he's saying trust and obey God. This is the thing that we should do the most of all those things. That's his conclusion. Some of the things he points out is the imbalances of life, the way that the balance, the way things are. You see certain people get things they shouldn't have, and some people don't get things that they should have. Life isn't always fair. Life isn't always balanced. We know that, but that's what he's pointing out. My recommendation is to throw away your superstitions, throw away the need for certainty in life, throw away the thoughts about how you think life should work, 
there's a time for every season in life, and this may be the season you're in, so be in this season, not overly think about the next one. Good and bad things will happen to me, and we and I are in God's hands. And all that leads me to is why we need Jesus. Pretty cool Easter's coming up, and here we are talking about Jesus. It's almost like we planned it, huh? Um, but these are, there are things, like things for things are not enough, as we t- talked about earlier. Money for the sake of having money isn't enough. Work for the sake of work isn't enough. Wisdom for the sake of having wisdom isn't enough. And righteousness for the sake of just having righteousness isn't enough. The only thing that's going to be enough is having Jesus for Jesus. That is going to be enough for you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we all just come to you right now, Father, and we just... You just hear of of these words, Lord, the words that are in your Bible, your words, Lord, and the imbalances of life and the injustices in life and the chaos and the pros and the cons, Lord. And I just thank you that we're able to take this time, take these scriptures, take the few things that I was able to pull out of here, Lord, in this time, and let it just soak and sink into our lives and into our days and into our hearts. Lord, that at any moment that we are worried or stressed or feel like life is just the imbalance of life isn't fair but that we just remember lord we we know it's a fact it is what it is the tree falls where it falls but you are still god and we are still in your hands and eternity is something that you still have for us and you promised for us lord and so i ask lord that you remind us to enjoy more meals to enjoy more time with our family with our friends to enjoy the work that we do father but just enjoy it for what that is not to make it bigger in our life lord than we want it to be, not to put our hope in it, but to, again, keep our hope in you. I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. The time you waited for, which is your taste buds to activate, has come. I think there's a service tonight. Enjoy it. Have a nice day.